In Dartmoor in southern England, there is this legend that goes back a little over a hundred years about this pair of disembodied and hairy human-like hands that will mysteriously manifest to individuals who are driving along a certain road, seize control of your vehicle, and then force you off the road. When I was a kid, and I first read this story, it scared the absolute bejesus out of me. I'm a very visual person, and so I was envisioning the hands actually moving the steering wheel, and um, there were descriptions of it like tapping on the windows, and so there was the sound of nails clicking inside my head too. So it was the sound and the movement that I imagined from these disembodied hands that really freaked me out. And I didn't have the words for it then, to understand that I was dealing with a sense of the uncanny. But I look back on it now and I think, yeah, of course, that's, that's exactly what that was. Welcome back to the Uncanny Valley. This time, we're here to explore sound and movement. If you haven't checked out part one of the Uncanny Valley, you might want to go back and watch that one because in that one, I give a little bit more history into how the idea of the Uncanny Valley developed. And in that video, I focus almost exclusively on visuals and how some individuals have a negative response to non-human primates because of the remarkable similarity that they have to human beings. And that this similarity combined with the differences creates a tension that, again, for some people, is extremely uncomfortable. So I want to give the same caveat that I gave before, which is to say that this is not a rationalization for abuse. This is not an excuse for abuse. The uncanny valley effect is simply a framework for understanding how some people can have a really negative response. So in that first video, I go back to this guy here, Sigmund Freud. And in 1919, he wrote an essay called Uncanny. And he frames this understanding of the uncanny as a sense of eeriness or discomfort when something that is familiar becomes unfamiliar. But what I didn't mention was that Freud was actually building on the ideas of this guy, Ernst Jentsch. Go ahead and try to say that five times fast. In 1906, Jentsch wrote this, The Psychology of the Uncanny. Or really, if we translate it more accurately, it would be the psychology of the creepy or the psychology of eeriness. And he was focusing on the state of being between inanimate and animate, so alive or not alive. And so to illustrate his point, he talked about wax sculptures of important figures, which I, to be perfectly honest, I have always avoided going to see wax sculptures because, yeah. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, that's a great lesson in theory, Monkey Sentinel, but would you just get to the point? And here it is. In 1970, Masihara Mori wrote Uncanny Valley, in which he talks about the corpse as being the primo example of something that elicits an uncanny feeling in us. But he added something, and he said that when movement is added into the whole equation or the whole experience, then the feelings of uncanniness that we have are increased. And to illustrate this point, he mentioned zombies. Now, of course, zombies have been around in various cultures for a long, 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 long time. But in the 1960s, George Romero released his Night of the Living Dead. And we got this visual representation of this almost human, but not quite creature. And when it comes to our reactions to non-human primates, specifically the macaque babies, which are so prone to the social media abuse that we are talking about, I feel like movement is an extremely important part of the equation. But the thing that Maury doesn't talk about, which I also feel is important, is sound. One time when I was a little kid, we went camping, and my dad was a big-time outdoorsman, and we spent a lot of time out in the woods. And it was like 3 o'clock in the morning, everybody was asleep, and I woke up to this blood-curdling scream. What had driven the hairs up on my neck was the fact that it sounded so human. And some primate vocalizations can be eerily close 
to human speech. So I found some audio of gelato baboons making noises in the background. And I want you to listen to this. If you have a creature that has so many characteristics to human beings, and then it's making noises that are maybe close to human, but also very much not, it can elicit this kind of uncanny valley response. To illustrate this, both sound and movement, I'm going to play a little clip of a long-tailed infant macaque who has just been dressed and is a little bit stressed about it and is trying to cling. My son made all kinds of noises when he was a baby, but uh, he never really sounded quite like this. And the squeaking is something that the monkey hate community really likes to talk about and to uh, <laughs> to go on about. You would think as much as they hate it, they wouldn't talk about it as much. You'd think they'd avoid it. <laughs> What are you doing now? I was having a tantrum. Oh. Well, don't get your clothes all dirty. And so this leads me to talking about one of the most popular searches that anyone has about monkey babies online, which is tantrums. Some people think they're cute. Some people think they're annoying. Some people think it's the sound of the devil sucking on helium. <laughs> And the monkey hate community will often use tantrums as an excuse to really justify the abuse. But I want you to take that with a grain of salt because the monkey hate community will pretty much use any excuse to justify abuse. It turns out that macaque babies, as dramatic as they may be, and they are very dramatic, have tantrums for precisely the same reasons that humans have tantrums. And I know that that is going to make some of the people listening to this absolutely lose their minds. But it's the truth. So when little kids, little human kids, have a tantrum, it's because there's this tiny part of their brain called the amygdala that essentially short circuits. The amygdala is kind of the emotional regulation center of the whole brain. It's sometimes referred to as part of the underbrain because it's not part of reasoning or rational thinking. And so it gets overwhelmed by all of the big emotions. And then the hypothalamus, which helps control the endocrine system, gets involved. It floods the body with flight or fight hormones. They don't have a fully formed prefrontal cortex. Humans don't have that part of their brain fully formed until they're about the age of 25. And it turns out that the neurology and physiology of macaque tantrums are almost exactly the same. So their amygdala gets overloaded, and then the hypothalamus floods out all of these stress hormones, and they also don't have a fully formed prefrontal cortex, and they just kind of fall apart. And usually we associate this with weaning, like the baby wants to nurse and mom wants a break from it, and so the baby freaks out. So here we have an older juvenile that mom is trying to wean. And so the uploader to this video is actually sped, sped it up to increase the kind of agitation and to increase the sort of jerky motions that people really respond to. Um, and also to make it seem like this is a more violent interaction than it really is. VOs do this all of the time, and people who own the channels do this kind of thing all the time. They want you to believe that monkey moms are mean and cruel, um, because it spreads this kind of distaste and hate for these animals, and so therefore it ultimately serves their purposes. But this monkey kid, he... Um, eventually goes up the tree and just kind of yells to the world about his discontent. Which for me is really funny and charming because it is such a human thing to do. But there's another aspect to tantrums that's really, really important to mention for both macaques and humans. And that is social pressure. Have you ever been in a grocery store or on an airplane or in a crowded public space and a little kid starts to throw a massive temper tantrum. 
So researchers found that if a macaque baby threw a tantrum and there were no other members of the troop around besides the mother or the primary caregiver, then the mother was less likely to actually give in to the demands of the baby. But if there were other members of the troops around, then the mother was more inclined to give in to the demands of the baby, especially if those members of the troop were higher ranking than the mother. And this is largely because the troop doesn't want to hear the cries of the babies. I mean, again, going back to the human analogy, people getting annoyed on an airplane at a screaming child, for example. With macaque moms, they have to address the behavior of their, their offspring if there are higher ranking adults around. Because if they don't, then they could get hurt. Either the baby could get hurt or they themselves could get hurt. And again, even if you don't like listening to them cry, and even if seeing them throw temper tantrums for some reason just sends you over the top, makes you incredibly angry, uncomfortable, whatever, it does not justify watching videos of abuse. It does not justify watching videos of torture. And I'm sorry if you don't like hearing that, but it's not psychologically healthy. As you can see by some of these comments that the monkey hate community leaves in response to these animals throwing tantrums. There are so many ways that our lives intersect with non-human primates in our culture, in our mythologies, in how we other other human beings. That understanding this kind of deep fundamental psychological and emotional relationship we have with these animals is a really important undertaking. And I think that it can go a long way in teaching us not only about the animals, but about ourselves.